Good afternoon. I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement that we stand on the land of the Bejigal people and we draw inspiration from their story. And I, I pay my respects to them as the traditional custodians of this land and I also pay my respects to elders both past and present. It's my great pleasure today to welcome back to UNSW Sydney the Honourable Malcolm Turnbull, Prime Minister of Australia. Before I invite the Prime Minister up to speak, I'd also like to acknowledge that we have many distinguished guests in this room, too many to read all their names, but I, I will mention that we have ambassadors, consul general, representatives from the diplomatic corps, fellow vice chancellors, and my colleagues from across the Group of Eight and Universities of Australia, you're all very welcome. And of course, members of the UNSW community from UNSW Council, Management Board, Deans, Pro Vice Chancellors, student staff, alumni and industry partners. You're all very welcome here today and Prime Minister, welcome to UNSW. There has never been, dare I say it, a more exciting time for our university. As we approach our 70th anniversary next year, we look back on a track record of world-class education, strong engagement with the community, and outstanding research. Most of you will know that UNSW is now home to almost 60,000 students, more than 6,000 staff, and we've just last month reached the milestone of a 300,000 strong network of alumni spread across the globe. And although, Prime Minister, we can't claim you as being amongst our alumni, we are very proud to say that Lucy is one of our success stories. <laughs> UNSW today, like many of the other universities in the group of eight, is amongst the top 50 universities in the world. And impressively, on a per capita basis, Australia has more top 100 ranked universities than powerhouses of higher education like the USA and the UK and more than China. The group of eight universities are a big part of that success story. And the core of that success, I believe, comes down to one crucial element. It isn't our buildings, or the rankings, or the funding, though they're all helpful. It is our people. Next week, I'll be in Canberra at the National Press Club, launching a report on behalf of the Group of Eight, which shows the billions of dollars that we generate for the national economy. In my speech, I plan to talk about an idea which you, Prime Minister, often circle back on. It's the idea that it's not economic capital that defines the true wealth of nations, but human capital. In your words, Prime Minister, the most valuable resource we have in our nation is not under the ground, it's walking around on top of it. It is the core business of universities to develop and nurture that human capital. Outstanding universities, of course, educate students, but they're also hubs of knowledge, supporting researchers whose work contributes to social cohesion, international understanding, and life-changing scientific discovery. I believe that universities are unique because they're beacons of freedom, tolerance, free inquiry, and that they will play a key role in tackling the grand challenges of our time, inequality, climate change, and migration, to name just a few. It's my belief that in our growing climate of, po of global political instability, universities can emerge as important agencies for policy improvement and active positive change. And a key driver of that will be international education and international partnerships. The more students and researchers we have traveling abroad, crossing paths with new people, absorbing and understanding different cultures, the stronger our civil society will be and the greater possibility 
there will be for our research impact to expand and create opportunities for our Australian population. Given all of that, Prime Minister, I'm very much looking forward to your reflections today. I'd like to ask you all to join me in welcoming Australia's Prime Minister, the Honourable Malcolm Turnbull. Well, uh, well thank, thank you very much, Vice-Chancellor. Thank you for your warm welcome. Thank you for your acknowledgement of country. Uh, I'm delighted to be here at the University of New South Wales. As you acknowledged, I, I, one of my many deficiencies is I'm not a graduate of this university, but uh, I can say that uh, my wife, Dr Lucy Turnbull, sends her apologies to her alma mater. Uh, the University of New South Wales proudly describes itself as Australia's global university. And I want to talk today about the contribution of international education to our nation, our region, and, and in particular, highlight its vital importance to our comprehensive strategic partnership with China. Now, your work here demonstrates to our neighbours in the most practical way that our commitment to the Indo-Pacific region is firm and abiding. And that makes you, Australian educators, all of you, and not just those from the University of New South Wales, one of our greatest assets. And that's why my government's national strategy for international education 2025 embodies our ongoing commitment to entrench Australia as a world leader in education, training and research. Just as trade deals, economic partnerships, security agreements all foster community among countries, so too the connections that you forge build bridges across the seas that separate us physically from our regional partners. You bring the world together. Vice-Chancellor, you talked about your global network of hundreds of thousands of alumni, that they are really the sinews of dynamism and economic growth and partnership that we want to see more of. Now, the ongoing role of Australian education in the region is vital for the security and prosperity of the Indo-Pacific. And as I often say, you can't have one without the other. Security and prosperity go hand in hand. International education is so much more than foreign students coming to study in Australia and leaving with a degree. Every arrival here is the start of a relationship that grows, adapts, renews, and ultimately benefits us all. Dr Jing Guan, who is with us today, is a great example. She is a civil and environmental engineer who completed her PhD here in 1999 and spent the next decade at the Centre for Water and Wastewater Technology. She's now the chief scientist at Beijing Origin Water, one of China's largest water treatment membrane technology companies that's producing two billion tonnes of high quality reclaimed water a year. Beijing Origin Water has emerged as a strong research partner for UNSW, and it makes perfect sense for nations that face challenges with water security to work together on this. And you can imagine how relevant so much of the research on water that's done at this university, particularly in Dr. Jing's, Dr. Guan's uh, field, but also particularly in the form of, in the area of groundwater research, uh, you can imagine how relevant that is. Uh, particularly now as we face this uh, extremely severe drought in Eastern Australia. Now, Dr Guan is just one of thousands of examples of international students who, even after they return home, are working on projects that will help deliver benefits to Australia as well. We've always done best as a nation, economically and socially, when we've been open to the world. And the Indo-Pacific has also done best when Australia is fully engaged and committed to our shared prosperity and security. It's why the Menzies government worked so hard to establish the Colombo Plan in January 1950, which delivered regional security and prosperity through development founded in education and training. The University of New South Wales was the first Australian university to welcome scholarship students under the scheme. And today, we recognise the value in these exchanges to such a degree that we've established the new Colombo Plan to help Australian students study overseas 
and undertake work placements across the Indo-Pacific region. They go to Indonesia, China, India, Japan, Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, among other nations, and every student embodies Australia's commitment to the region. They improve our collective understanding of our neighbours. Their personal connections are the grassroots of our relationship, and our international education sector works hard to nurture them. The University of New South Wales has embraced international partnerships and collaboration, particularly with China, through the TORCH program. Chinese Premier Li Keqiang and I were pleased to endorse the agreement for this precinct at the signing ceremony in the Great Hall of the People in 2016. Premier Li described it, and I quote, as a shining beacon of bilateral cooperation in innovation and entrepreneurship. And he's right. Now, just one example of that is Sean Lee's work on graphene-enhanced high-performance electricity grid transmission lines. Professor Lee, who's also here with us today, is originally from Guangzhou and came to Australia via Singapore. Now, for those who don't live and breathe the energy sector, and there must be a few left that, <laughs> that aren't in that category today, graphene is an extraordinarily thin and flexible material with 40% better conductivity than copper. As a result of this work, UNSW has signed a $20 million deal with the Chinese company Hangzhou Cables. It's expected to be able to boost transmission by 5%. Now, that might not sound like much, but 5% in a Chinese context equates to saving 275 terawatt hours, which is more than the total annual electricity generation in Australia. So this is a great partnership, critical at a time when the world is grappling with higher energy demands and costs. It helps us do more with less energy consumption, helps reduce global uh, carbon dioxide emissions. And because the intellectual property is Australian owned, there are also significant economic benefits to us here in financial terms. Now, as Professor Lee says, collaboration between industry and institutions, both in Australia and overseas, is essential to getting the greatest benefits from academic research. One of the most globally momentous collaborations between Australia and China has been that led by Professor Martin Green, who earlier this year became the first Australian to win the prestigious Global Energy Prize for revolutionising the efficiency and cost of solar photovoltaics. Now, Professor Green and his team started researching photovoltaics here in the 1970s, and by 1998 had made a 50% improvement in the efficiency of silicon solar cells. At the same time, a number of his graduates, including Shi Zheng Rong, founded solar panel manufacturing ventures in China. Indeed, several of the largest Chinese solar power companies began as Australian Chinese ventures. As Martin describes it, at the time, the Chinese government and governments elsewhere in the world were mostly focused on wind as the most prospective renewable energy source. And so it was largely private sector investment that got the Chinese solar industry underway. Now, the collaboration has continued with constant improvements in manufacturing technique and technology, resulting in extraordinary advances in the affordability of solar power. I recall being a very enthusiastic environment minister in 2007, and the, the uh, reduction in cost and the levelised cost of electricity from solar photovoltaics has surpassed even my wildest and most optimistic uh, uh, ambitions for that technology. And so much of it has happened here. The University of New South Wales developed PERC technology has lifted efficiency to 25%. It's found in most of the world's solar cells, most of the world's solar cells incorporated technology developed here. And its successor, which Martin Green has proved in his laboratory here, will lift it to 40%. Imagine what that's going to do. Now, all these improvements in the efficiency of photovoltaics, the technology and the science that enable that, has come from collaborations between Australian and Chinese scientists. Of the 100 PhD students working under Professor Green, Half, he says, are Chinese students. Professor Lee and Professor Green and the hundreds of Australian and Chinese students who've worked with them 
are both the foundation and the product of our great collaboration and they offer the prospect of more in the future. Now my own history with China goes back decades to my work in northern China investigating uh, mining opportunities and establishing what is now a large zinc and lead and gold mine in Hebei province in 1994. In those days as now, the partnership between Australians and Chinese, the spirit of collaboration was absolutely vital. In fact, one of our geologists, Dr. Zhou Bo, is here now with us, was educated in China, did his PhD at Sydney University. He's not perfect, Vice-Chancellor. But he did do, do postdoctoral work right here at the University of New South Wales. And he's got a University of New South Wales tie on. And uh, he's been doing business back and forth between Australia and China, including with the Tsai Jia Ying uh, mine ever since. So it's wonderful to be with Bo today as well. So that's what I mean when I talk about family and engagement. You know, there are 1.2 million Australians of Chinese heritage, two of whom are Lucy's and my grandchildren. It's a very deep relationship, one of great opportunity and potential, and it gets deeper and stronger all the time. Modern Australia is unimaginable without the talented and dynamic contribution of Australians of Chinese descent. They're a vital thread in the fabric of Australian society, the most successful multicultural society in the world. And we continue to welcome students, tourists, researchers, investors from China. Our relationship, of course, with the People's Republic of China dates back to our adoption of the One China policy in 1972. At that time, both Australia and China agreed to establish a relationship based on mutual respect and equality. We be began a truly remarkable journey. Both countries set about a process of reform which lowered barriers and opened the way to growth, driven by exchanges of people, goods, investment and ideas. As I said in Shanghai in 2016, during my first visit to China as Prime Minister, the story of our relationship is one of how our two countries have changed and changed each other in ways that are leading to more jobs, growth, investment and prosperity, and more ability for Australians and Chinese to realise their dreams. And we're committed to working with China's leaders to advance our comprehensive strategic partnership, a great framework within which to advance our mutual and complementary interests and along with CHAFTA, China-Australia Free Trade Agreement, another legacy of President Xi's historic 2014 visit to Australia. We welcome China's remarkable success and we've embraced its many opportunities. Now this year, China is celebrating the 40th anniversary of the beginning of the historic reform and opening up policy led over many years by Deng Xiaoping. Deng, of course, invoked the Ming Dynasty voyages of Admiral Zheng He and famously observed that China has been strong and prosperous when open to the world, but weak when closed to it. And while the historical experience is very different, the contemporary experience is similar. Both Australia and China have prospered by being more open to trade and investment, not least by continuing and deepening collaboration together. Now, the nations of the Indo-Pacific are hugely diverse, from giants like the United States, China, India, Japan, Indonesia, to some of the smallest island states. And yet the region has set an example of security and prosperity, brought about by the countries of the region identifying their common interests and respectfully managing their differences. Now, naturally, we pursue our own national interest, but as we said in our foreign policy white paper last year, we're strongly committed to collaboration and partnership. Over the years, the security and peace of the region has been underpinned by the United States, indeed, for many decades. And as other nations become stronger economically, and not just China, I should note, the need for collaboration based on mutual respect is more important than, other, than ever. In other words, Australia's collaborative instincts are more suited to the present, given the world is more interconnected and interdependent than ever. The nations of the region have to collaborate more closely, and so we have a very strong commitment to all the regional groupings, including ASEAN, 
the East Asia Summit, APEC and the Pacific Islands Forum, to name but a few. Now I've been thinking, writing and speaking about the geopolitics of our region and China in particular for many years, as has just about everyone else. So let me briefly outline what is well known and understood, identify some misperceptions and propose what is, I trust, clearer thinking. We're living in a time when the pace and scale of change is unprecedented in all of human history. That's worth reflecting on. It is utterly unprecedented. If you just think about, think about one revolutionary device, the smartphone. First iPhone was produced in 2007. It's not that long ago. Now, this transformation has been nowhere bigger or faster than in our region. And in just 40 years, China has gone from barely participating in the global economy to being the world's largest or second largest national economy, depending on the measure. And in terms of trade, it is now the largest trading partner for half of all the G20 economies, including, of course, our own. Rapid change can be unsettling, but it is a big mistake to assume it will inevitably lead to conflict, as Graham Allison theorised with his Thucydides trap just as it is a mistake to assume that China will assume vis-a-vis -vis the United States the role of the Soviet Union in the Cold War, or for that matter, that the United States and its allies would or should seek to contain China. Now, will a stronger, richer China have a more confident and assertive voice in world affairs? Of course it will. Will it seek to persuade other countries that its point of view is correct? Will it try to get the best deals it can in trade? Of course it will, like everybody else does. But of course, when it comes to trade, we should never forget that protectionism is self-defeating. Uh, not a ladder to get you out of the low growth trap, but a shovel to dig it deeper, as I described it. And at the same meeting in Hangzhou, uh, equivalent to locking yourself in a darkened room, as President Xi said. Both metaphors seeking to convey the same message. In trade, there will always be more winners, more growth and more jobs on a level playing field. And that's why Australia seeks to advance free trade and open markets in every part of the world. So in the midst of this rapid change, Australia continues to address its own interests by pursuing a relationship with China based on mutual respect and understanding. For our part, we act to advance Australia's prosperity ensure the independence of our decision making and secure the safety and freedom of our people. And in doing so, we support an international order based on the rule of law, where might is not right and the sovereignty of all nations is respected by others. A principle President Xi endorsed when he addressed a joint sitting of the Australian Parliament in November 2014 and said, and I quote, the United Nations Charter and the basic norms governing international relations should apply to all countries. With that, countries big or small, strong or weak, rich or poor are all equal. This means not only equal rights and interests for all countries, but also equality of all countries before international rules. Now, global infrastructure investment is a good example of where countries should work together, as we are, for example, in the Asia Development Bank and more recently, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. As Trade Minister Stephen Chobo observed in Shanghai recently, we look forward to working with China on Belt and Road Initiative projects, where, assessing them on their merits, we conclude they're consistent with our objective standards and priorities. Generally, we welcome more investment in infrastructure in our region. Indeed, it would be hard to identify a country in our region more open to foreign investment, including Chinese investment, than is Australia. And we want to work with China, the US, Japan and others in the Pacific to ensure that our respective engagement, including lending, reinforces our common goals of supporting the sustainable economic development, freedom and well-being of the people and the nations of the Pacific. Now, a particular example of where we can work together is tackling the region's energy challenges. We both face challenges of providing affordable and sustainable energy to remote areas. We've, Australia has developed 
significant expertise in off-grid applications, a particular priority for China with its desire to improve energy access across its broad landmass. And I look forward to building on my discussions with Chinese leaders on cooperation in pumped hydro projects, an area in which China and now Australia uh, both have considerable expertise. Now we're seeing record government's investment in scientific research, including our support here at the University of New South Wales for the work of our Australian of the Year, Michelle Simmons. Michelle's team at the Centre for Quantum Computation and Communications Technology are undertaking world-leading research to create a quantum computer chip in silicon. Education is helping to diversify our workforce, equipping Australian workers with a range of skills and the adaptability they need in order to have successful careers in the modern economy. Over the last two decades, our universities and TAFEs have trained hundreds of thousands of new healthcare and social workers, helping the industry make the largest contribution to employment growth over the period, the NDIS being the most recent example of this. And international education is now a $30.8 billion export industry for Australia, our third largest export industry, and our single largest services export industry. Now, the impact of that success is felt well beyond the campus. 130,000 full-time jobs are supported by international education and the benefits flow right through the economy to retail, tourism, hospitality, healthcare, medical services and so much more. Now, our ability, Australia's ability, to capitalise on the opportunities of this region depends on strong links to the region and the education sector has the capacity to influence this like few other industries. Look around yourselves. You, in this room, you see a small group, a, a sample if you like, of an enormous engagement and collaboration with our region that has enabled us to grow and prosper and deliver benefits right across the region for ourselves and our neighbours underpinning the peace, the security and the prosperity that we all aspire to. Now I have every confidence that you, our teachers and researchers, will step up your pursuit of excellence and in doing so reaffirm your independence and commitment to the values of academic freedom. Because that, as Ian, the Vice-Chancellor, flagged at the outset, is really your greatest and most valuable currency. Our universities have played a key role in the story of Australia's engagement and integration with the region, responding to the challenges and opportunities of these exciting times, these most exciting times, Vice-Chancellor. And I know that in doing so, you'll play an even greater role in our future. Thank you all very much. Well, Prime Minister, thank you for those very rousing words today. Um, it was indeed, I think for all of us, a spirited affirmation of the importance of Australian universities to our nation's engagement with our region, in particular China and the world. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet to also thank the University of New South Wales and the Group of Eight for hosting this event. Um, I'm pleased to offer this vote of thanks to you as Chair of Universities Australia and on behalf of all our world-class universities. Let me just say that your words resonated strongly with all of us. University Australia launched yesterday a new communications as part of our one in half a million campaign. That's the half a million international students that are currently in Australia. And that set of communications highlights the vast benefits to Australia from educating wonderful students from all around the world. And that is a very significant number, that more than half a million that now study and choose to study in Australia. And just last month, a British-based research centre 
tipped that Australia would overtake the United Kingdom as the world's second most popular destination for international students by 2019. And that's quite an achievement given our relative size and scale in the world. So what you spoke about today is dear to us, but it's dear to us because we believe it's such a success story for this country and for our people. It's not only great news for Australia's communities and local economies who benefit from the talents, the energy and contribution of our international students, but also, as you so clearly demonstrated in your address, from the international research partnerships that lead to innovations that are for the betterment of all of us. I thought what was particularly telling is your commitment to that openness, that openness that is important to building Australia's friendships with the world. And I think you reminded us very strongly of how important that is. Because when our truly brilliant international students are welcomed into uh, our communities during their study years, they go back to their home countries with a deep affection for Australia. And so do those who come to us and form part of our wonderful staff. So when, in some decades hence, the students that are here on this campus now and in campuses around Australia head major IT companies in Singapore, become foreign ministers perhaps in Indonesia, become important political figures in China, heading research and development enterprises in India, all things that our alumni currently do, they kindle opportunities for the mutual benefit of our countries. They open those doors. They are a testament to our openness. And we'd like to share with you that in that half a million set of videos, we've talked with students, not scripted students, completely unscripted testimonials from international students. And I say to all of you, it, it's heartening to listen to them. Um, a communications student, Mia from China, says, I think my favourite part of Australia is the people. I just can't believe how friendly people could be. They say it again and again that people reach out, that they reach out to them, whether they're students from China or Zimbabwe or Malaysia. They say there's always someone who can help you no matter what and they are friendly and approachable. That virtuous circle, that experience, nurtured carefully over six decades now by Australian universities, that's the backbone of those relationships and it's the result of years, may I say, of political support. And we, you particularly referenced um, former Prime Minister Menzies, but we have had bipartisan support to wi for which we thank the As Australian Parliament for a quality system that brings the next generation of global leaders. So again, on behalf of our university, I really want to thank you um, for your words today because you put the importance of Australian education to our nation's friendships in the world in a very important context, in a context of support and commitment to open economies and open societies. And that's a very important and strong message which we endorse. And I also want to thank your federal ministerial colleagues on the Council for International Education who share responsibility with us to support and nurture Australia's credentials, as indeed the great place it is for people to come to study. We also thank indeed every Australian who welcomes our international students with warmth and generosity the thing they feel that makes the difference to their experience here. We should never underestimate the power of those friendships, what it means when someone comes so far away and finds excitement and inspiration and a new way of looking at the world and the things that develop from that, not just the friendships but the innovations, the way we transform the world around us, they resonate resonate throughout our lives and yours. We're all part of this nation building task and you put Prime Minister so clearly what that nation building task is before us. We in the universities feel that we are an important part of that and our country is stronger for stronger universities and for a strong commitment to an open economy, an open society and to great international education Again, my deep thanks.
Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Prime Minister. We, we've heard some truly important words today. That brings us to the end of the formal proceedings, but our guests are all invited to a reception down the stairs. Please do join us. Thank you very much, everyone.